Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us um, on this uh, fabulous Tuesday. The New Economy Network Australia welcomes you to this very special discussion um, with Amanda Janu about um, the policy design guide for uh, building a well-being economy. But before I do that, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, my name is um, Michelle Maloney. I'm one of the co-founders and directors of the New Economy Network Australia. And in a minute, I'll give you a brief intro to who we are and a reminder to please join us for our amazing annual conference, um, which you can connect all of it, all, to all of it online um, in only a couple of weeks. And I'll just give a little plug. But first, I'd like to acknowledge country. I'd like to acknowledge I'm here on Yagara Turrbal country here in beautiful North Brisbane. I'd like to acknowledge elders past, present and emerging and the remarkable governance system um, that cared for country and care cared for each other um, since time immemorial and um, into the present day. I'd also like to acknowledge some of my um, fabulous co-workers, co folks who I'm working with for the We All Australia Hub. I can see Mike Silvaris, Bob Costanza, Saul Creswell. So I'd just like to acknowledge everyone here. So um, in a moment, I'll introduce Amanda Janu. But first, I just wanted to share screen and remind you all a little bit about who Nina is and what we've been up to. So for those, I see a lot of familiar faces and welcome back, but for those who um, don't know about Nina, the New Economy Network Australia or Nina started to begin forming in um, mid 2016 when Bronwyn Morgan and I um, hosted a conference that we um, put together in Sydney, but with a very specific view to inviting people to consider building a civil society network for um, a very different economy to the one we have dominating our systems today. Interestingly, it wasn't until um, about a year later um, when I was having a, a cup of tea actually with Bob Costanza at the 2017 NINA conference um, that he started to tell me about this awesome international network that was forming up around the idea of a well-being economy. The reason I like to mention it is in the times when we were trying to create um, a broad platform, a big space for everyone to come together and really push for a different kind of idea about what the economy is, um, there was no single framing. There were so many different kinds of ways you could describe social solidarity, ecological economics, steady state, collaborative sharing, lots of wonderful ways to describe a different form of, of economic system. Um, but we chose new as a very particular branding or a particular broad framing that meant both nothing and everything. And what I'm excited about with the rise and rise of well-being economy uh, frameworks is it really does offer a strong um, alternative to the, the sort of the standard growth economy or the capitalist economy framework. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, and one of the reasons I do mention that is that when we formed up Nina in 2016, and you can see here on the website, we're a network of organizations and individuals working to create an ecologically healthy and socially just society by transforming the, the economic system. Um, and what we've got is a wonderful distributed governance network where we've got lots of different hubs and people coming in, not to duplicate or, or double up or to do extra work, but to just endlessly share all of the good stuff that's already out there and then uh, joining up and hopefully um, starting to really forge a systems change approach to the economic system itself. So there's a whole lot more I could say about Nina, but I won't. But I did just want to mention to you all that this framing matters because over the next year or two, now that Nina is hosting the We All Australia Hub, um, we'll be rethinking a lot of how we um, forge this different future together and the important role that wellbeing economic frameworks can play in the bigger system. The only other thing I wanted to mention to you all is if you go to our website, you'll see um, our fabulous annual conference, New Economy, uh, conference for 2021. We framed it around growing a well-being economy for Australia. It's a complete hybrid. We had so many proposals for the conference, we decided to turn it into well-being economy week. Um, and I think because so many of us spend so much time online now, it's um, probably going to be well-being economy week for many years to come rather than just a three-day weekend because we can't fit everything in anymore, even with multiple sessions. And then the only other thing, I really urge you to have a peek at the program whenever you get a minute. It's not beautiful yet. This is kind of the draft as all of our speakers lock in, but we've got amazing range of really terrific speakers, everything from looking at climate and systems change to the role of government. Rethinking value is one of the big themes of our work for the next year or two and beyond. 
just lots and lots of fantastic people sharing their work and their ideas. So I just wanted to share all that with you. Um, but that's about it from me. So um, Amanda is really kindly joining us from Vermont. Um, and Amanda is the Knowledge and Policy Lead at the International Wellbeing Economy Alliance, or we all, as we call our beloved international network. Nina is one of the sort of founding members of we all, and we've been watching with excitement as they've been building and building um, not just the country hubs around the place, but some really remarkable resources, which brings us, of course, to Amanda. Um, and um, I'm going to leave us in the capable hands of Amanda. I'm here if she needs me, but this is her workshop to share with us um, the work they've been doing on the policy design guide. So, um, oh, and if you do have any questions for Amanda at this moment, it might be best if you write them in the chat. We will make sure we have time for discussion, but we might just let Amanda um, introduce the material first. So thank you so much. And over to you, Amanda. Oh, thanks so much, Michelle. Uh, it's absolutely lovely to be here with all of you. Greetings from Vermont. Um, as Michelle mentioned, I'm the Knowledge and Policy Lead for the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, which is a global alliance of organizations and academics, governments, change makers um, from all over the world who are really committed to transforming our economic system so that it really prioritizes the well-being of people and planet. And so I joined we all in March of 2020. So quite a time to start this job, of course, with COVID and all of the things that were going on. But prior to that, I worked in international development um, for quite a long time on industrial policy and trade policy and really just thought it was, you know, very passionate about this intersection between policy and the economy and felt very clear in working in these spaces that so often the goals of economic policy didn't seem to really align with what the real development objectives were of countries. And so much of the sort of my, I think, experience working in that sort of space on economic policy design has definitely influenced um, the ways that I'm going to speak to you today about the economy and the ways in which um, we as an organization believe that we can start to design policies in a different way in order to really rethink what the purpose of the economy is and how it can be in service of our social and ecological well-being. And so I'm going to share presentation here with you all. One second. Let's make sure I have this open. Here we go. Can everybody see this? Yes, okay, we can. Perfect. All right, perfect. So the presentation today, um, I mostly want to speak to, as Michelle said, our policy design guide, but also to just begin a little bit with for anybody who's not familiar with the well-being economy movement, what, how it sort of emerged, what it represents, um, and the vision for this different economic system, and then how we went about developing this guide and some of the practical tools and resources and case studies and examples that are within um, this policy design guide. And then would really love to spend as much time as possible really hearing from all of you, both in terms of your questions, but also I have questions for you as well um, in order to gain from your unique and diverse experience and perspectives on this really important topic as we're, we're figuring out how to really realistically build a well-being economy. So maybe to begin with, before I speak for a while, I'd love to hear from each of you. Um, if you want to just maybe type in the chat quickly or something like this, what is the first word that comes to your mind when you hear the word economy? Let me see how I can see the y'all's chat. Organizing. Mm -hmm. so that. Trading, exchange, destruction, interesting growth, jobs, donut, injustice, allocation. Wow, well, yeah, well, I can already tell that this <laughs> This is going to be quite the group here. <laughs> yeah. Division, barriers to providing justice, political and financial systems, problems of monetization, qualitative metrics of resources. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. Consumption. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think 
let me just say that that's all very much spot on, right? Um, and many of, I think, often our perceptions of the economy can be, as it's very, you know, oriented, it's a system of, of either, you know, wealth generation or around money, or as you said, various inequality. And all of this can often make the economy feel quite abstract. Um, so something which is very separate and distinct from our lived reality, something that we don't always fully have control over or that is like boring or technical things like this. But one of the ways in which we like to describe the economy is as it just being the way that we produce and provide for one another, right? And I think all of the ways that you were also speaking about the economy in many ways was about, it's a means, right? Like it's a system, it's uh, methods of either exchange or production all around issues around finance, but ultimately, yeah, it's a, it's an activity, it's a flow, it's a way in which we try to improve our quality of life. And so part of the problem is, of course, that we focus so much on the means um, in terms of how much we're producing or how much we're consuming or the level of you know, wealth generation that I've always really liked this quote by Einstein around him, him really saying that I think you know, this perfection of means and this confusion of ends is really what will characterize our age. And so that in many ways has been the dominant paradigm of let's just grow the economy as much as possible. Let's just produce for the sake of producing, not really considering what the quality or the impacts of that are and losing sight a little bit of, of what we're actually trying to achieve. And so I have this graph here actually by brilliant Bob and Ida, who I think are, are joining us today, where they illustrated, right? That you know our fixation on economic growth, on expanding production, as measured by GDP has led to its almost exponential increase, right? But that is not really leading to the um, translation to life satisfaction improvements or quality of life for many of people in the world. And it actually is making many of us worth off as a result. And so obviously you've already mentioned inequality several times and the just obscene level of inequality in the world right now is incredibly um, concerning because not only have we generated a, a system that, although we said, you know, if we allow for the concentration of wealth within certain hands, it'll trickle down, it's not trickling down, right? And so we're at a situation where the billionaires and certain corporations are controlling more and more of, of the global goods and the production systems. On top of this, obviously, our planet, our home is being destroyed. We are so fixated on growth that we've really lost uh, recognition that we need to focus more on balance, right? And so how do we really recognize that first and foremost, we are a part of this ecosystem and can be a positive and not just destructive force within it? And then when you add on top of that, really widespread globally increases in loneliness and anxiety and despair, it all starts to feel a little, yeah, overwhelming because then you add COVID on top of it, obviously, and it can feel a little bit like when our policymakers are facing all of these really, really important challenges, they keep prioritizing the economy as if it really matters, but it's difficult to really get people to care about the GDP or the economy when, you know, we're in a situation where the world's on fire and you can't hug your grandparents, right? Um, and so all of this is not lost on people um, because, you know, there, there's been this standard policy story for so long that the major aim of government needs to be to grow the economy as quickly as possible because this is the way that we can get some taxes in order to fix some of the damages that are done in the process, right? But that story is not really resonating with people in the same way that I think it used to in the past. And so what we're seeing now as a result of a lot of different surveys is that around the world, the majority of people are now realizing that our current economic system is doing more harm than good. They're really losing trust in our collective institutions like government because they see them as really just working in service of 
of the few. And so as a result, um, you know, even the supposed winners of the system, the G20 countries, you have nearly three quarters of people wanting and calling on their countries to shift their priorities from a narrow focus on just profits and wealth generation to really prioritizing and focusing on human well-being and ecological protection. And so that in many ways is the foundation of the well-being economy movement. And I think as Michelle was saying in the introduction, it comes on so under so many different banners, right? And so it can be post-growth or degrowth, donut economics, circular economy, buen vivir, um, business for the common good. There's so many different incredible initiatives all over the world, but at their core is a recognition that people and planet aren't here to serve the economy, right? That the economy is here to serve us and then we can get it to do more of the heavy lifting. So we can get it to actually work in a way that is positive as opposed to net negative for our people's and planet's well-being. And so with this, oops, my apologies, with this um, aim in mind, the well-being economy movement is really about how do we shift from just fixing and healing and redistributing to really getting it right in the first place, right? How can we increase our ambitions? So we're not just trying to reduce inequality, but build a really just and fair system. How do we move from just mitigating climate change to actively regenerating our natural world through the way in which we're producing and providing from one another? And so that is really at the heart of the well-being economy movement. And this is at least for we all, um, we, we speak about it often with the idea of certain needs, right? Certain really core ideas of what should be indicators of success for our economy and the ways in which we should orient and build an economy that works in service of, of us all. And so the first one is our fundamental need for dignity, right? And so the purpose of the economy really should be to ensure that everybody has enough and that they feel secure in that enough so that they can live a life of safety and happiness. But really critically that we need also really need this to be a fair system so that justice sits at the heart of the ways in which we are ensuring and providing for the things that we need to have a life of dignity so that the system is pre-distributed by design so that we are promoting, you know, activities like cooperatives and alternative business models and, and ways in which from the beginning we can, we can distribute wealth and power to ensure that we build a more just and fair system for everyone. And critically at the heart of all of this is our fundamental interconnection and need for nature. So recognition that we need a safe and restored natural environment and that we have the capacity to produce things in a way which is regenerative, which ensures limited waste, that is, you know, reduces planned obsolescence, that um, really ensures that we are actually using the economy and our time and our creativity and our work to regenerate our ecosystem. And fundamentally, you know, and I think this is really important, it's about recognizing that the economy is more than just about monetary exchange, it's about the way we connect with one another, it's about the way that we provide for one another. So at its heart, it's about honoring meaningful work and connections so that our work as caregivers or environmental stewards or artists or you know, any of, of this work is, is valued really for, for its contribution um, to our collective well being, and that we have trust in our institutions as a result that their orientation is right. And last but certainly not least is this need for participation because so many, I think, at least for me, a lot of my desire to get into economic policy was seeing how globalization had really eroded so many my sense at least, right, of having a voice over my community's collective development, over our livelihoods, over the ways in which we were able to really live in line with our values and objectives as a result of this particular system. And so all of that I'm sure sounds wonderful, right? Perfect, utopian, let's get, let's get to it. And so the question of course is how do we get there, right? How do we build this different economic system? And that was really at the heart of this project of moving from 
the what, what is a well-being economy, what it would be the idea, ideal metrics or policies to really saying how do we actually develop a different system for evaluating our economy, for building policies that can really support and, and design it. And so in starting with this, um, I we went out to the membership, so are we all membership, and invited anybody who was interested in engaging to participate and was just blown away at the response. So we ended up having almost 100, you know, people from all over the world contribute in various ways through workshops, drafting, meetings, reviews, case studies, etc. And so you'll see throughout the guide, there's quotes from different members who supported in the development. And I think Till's quote does a really good job of encapsulating the motivation for this policy design guide. And so he says, the flaws in mainstream economics and GDP are now well documented. But what we need is a practical guide on how to build a well-being economy and how to organize this transition in a really participatory and democratic way. And the reason we need this is not only so that we can institutionalize these processes and give tools to policymakers, but really critically to make it clear that a well-being economy is possible, right? It's a feasible alternative. And so <laughs> with this um, quite big aim in mind, we went about thinking through what are sort of principles and processes and tools and case studies that could support policymakers and communities to build this. And so before I get into the next part, I'd love to ask you a question again, which is what comes to your mind when you hear the word policy. So if you want, I can type in the chat. I'll have uh, whatever sort of words come to your mind. A lever, division, public service. Mm -hmm. Government, public services, support. Mm -hmm. Thinking, reinforcing norms, govern. Bureaucracy, <laughs> limitations, red tape. Yep. Frameworks, public servants, politicians, ways of thinking and working in equality. Yep, absolutely. Ooh, heteronormative, colonial and patriarchal. Mm -hmm. Yes, 100% funding, statement of intent. Competitive. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, let me start by just saying before I share my screen again that, you know, there's different understandings of policy, right? And so there's a difference also between maybe what you would have as a policy for your organization or how we understand sort of government policy. And this, one of the ways I like to describe policy is the way that we really just encourage and reward or discourage, right, particular kinds of behaviors in order to achieve our collective objectives. And so in a bit, I'll talk about, you know, different kind of policy instruments, but you know, we can try to require people to do things or ban them from doing things. We can provide them incentives to do certain things or, you know, um, taxes and or discourage certain things, et cetera. Right. And so there, I think that what I think somebody said in terms of a lever um, is, yeah, one of the ways in which I often like to think about policy and how it can impact and influence the shape and structure of our economy. But it has also, as all of you also said, many of those other bureaucracies, institutions, um, and yeah, fundamentally it being a paradigm and ways of thinking as well. So when we started out, <coughs> we spent a lot of time thinking about what are the principles that really need to underpin policy design for a well-being economy. And so when I'm talking about policy, it's like the process by which we develop these policies to influence behavior in line with our objective in this case of, of promoting collective well-being. And so the first principle, of course, is, is the goal orientation, right? So what is the goal to start with? How do we shift that goal from just being about you know, competitiveness or export orientation or um, GDP growth to really being first and foremost about our social and ecological well-being. And second of all, I want to put an emphasis on the contextual approach, because I, for me, this is a really important one, because one of the major frustrations of, of with modern economics is that really assumes that across space and time, 
all people are fundamentally the same and all economies are fundamentally the same, right? But if we recognize that we are the economy, it's the way we produce and provide for one another, then it's clear that our history and our culture, our resources, our um, policies, so many different aspects influence this system of, of the way we're gonna produce and provide for one another, what we're going to produce and how, et cetera. And so it's a really important to recognize that not only will a well-being economy look different in different places, but the journey will also be different and to allow space for that. The other, um, maybe I'll just mention two of the other principles that I think are really important, and one is participatory. And so that really, you'll, you'll notice throughout the guide, is, is very much at the heart, because we believe that in order for any shift, especially when we're talking about a shift as big as systems change to be sustainable, right? We need as many people to be engaged in these decisions as possible, and for us to shift from a very top-down you know, linear um, process of making these sort of decisions to a really bottom up and generative and collective approach. And finally, I'll, I'll emphasize the, the strength based one, because I think this is where it's actually a huge deviation because almost all policy starts with a problem. Yeah. And it says, oh, okay. So, you know, we need to grow our economy and the solution is we need more skills, tech and finance, right? So it's a very, what's the problem? What are we lacking? In order to like, in order to to get, overcome that problem, but if we start with a strength base and very much start with our goals, what are the things that we really want, and we really prioritize, and what do we already have within our community and our place that is illustrative of that, and that is working in service of that, and that we can build upon, it allows for one, I think, us to overcome this idea that any other economic system is going to be a worse one. And two, it helps us to really make sure that our economies are reflections of our collective of strengths, right, and our, our unique context. So with these principles in mind, we organize this guide into five sections. And they somewhat follow what a lot of policymakers would view as the policy um, cycle, which is around your vision, your agenda setting, how you transform that into a strategy to achieve it, the specific policies or levers that you implement to, to shift the system or the behaviors in line with that, the actual implementation, and then the evaluation. Now, the problem, of course, with writing anything is that it comes out linear, and that's not the way the policy happens, right? So I just want to make clear that all of these things, all of these different processes I'm going to talk about with you now, are super interconnected, right? So when we talk about assessments or evaluations, those come in and all of these different um, activities and there's there will be continuous feedback loops throughout. Um, but to begin with, the first section is all about developing a different vision of progress, right? And so how do we really move from not just articulating that, you know, inclusive and sustainable development matters or that, you know, social and ecological well-being matters, but to really internalize that um, and to embed it within our systems to make that the predominant goal of government and the metric of our collective success um, as a society. And so breaking that down into some questions, um, we thought about how do we really, first of all, even understand what matters for well-being? <laughs> yeah, because so that's an important beginning point. How do we craft and communicate that different vision, that different understanding of progress? And how do we ultimately measure well-being in a way to make sure that we're keeping on course um, and that we're evaluating success accordingly? And so I promise this will be the only time I show you an actual page of the guide, but um, I just want to give you a sense here of what you'll find if you want to use it. And so when we talk about how to understand what matters for well-being, First of all, you'll see the hows. And we recognize there's a lot of different ways to do that, right? And so you might use citizen assemblies or you might use surveys or focus groups, research, et cetera. And that there's examples of a lot of different ways in which governments have done it and tools here that you would click on to be able to use those different sorts of approaches. But importantly underneath this is the we all tips. And this is where our membership brings in their perspective, right? And their suggestions on best practice regarding this process. And so from Wheel's perspective, the best way to understand what matters for well-being is to ask people, 
<laughs> yeah, because it's important because you want to make sure that it's a it's reflective of their language, of their priorities. Um, and so a really good you know example is from Germany where they organized oh hundreds of community forums all around the country in the different regions as well as a huge online um, you know surveys and to ask people the fundamental question what mattered for their well-being and they got thousands of responses obviously but these are some of the ones that came up most often and I think what's interesting here is that you'll see a mix of like outcomes so things that are important in terms of let's say access to healthcare or work-life balance, but you also have values, which are, are in here, such as, you know, respect and consideration and solidarity and helpfulness, and then processes as well. So things like civic engagement um, and, you know, political participation. And so when we're thinking about how to define well-being, I think sometimes we focus a lot on the outcomes but the values and the processes are also really important and it's they're critical. Um, and so this is something which will come back later because it's a it's it's an area where we're starting to see more innovations on how to, for example, bring values and embed values within our policy design processes. And so then in the next process we talked about is how do we really craft and communicate this well-being vision? And so again, different governments will do it in different ways, but this is a picture here of Buen Vivir from Ecuador. And I think visual representations can be so incredibly powerful. Um, so you'll have examples of communities that, that ask this question of what do you like about living in your community or what is your vision for the future? And they'll make visual minutes, for example, because having that picture, as they say, um, can often, save you a thousand words in terms of a document. And so we're seeing a lot of more creative expressions through music and art and culture to really make sure that this, this new vision um, percolates more deeply than just a report, right? Or a, a metric or a statistics agency. And then importantly, the third um, question is how do we measure well-being? And what I wanna emphasize here again is that while in the guide you'll find, you know, a long list of examples of different sorts of well-being economy measurements. This guide's not going to tell you how to measure well-being, but it's rather trying to explore how you might go about that. And so I really love the example from Wales of when they were developing their future generations framework, which has seven well-being objectives. They asked all of the ministries over a long period to think about how can we measure these dimensions. And they included a bunch of criteria. And one of them, which I think is really important, was around how intuitive those indicators were going to be for people. Yeah, so how quickly somebody could see that indicator and immediately grasp its meaning and its significance for them and the well-being priority they had articulated. And that's something which I think oftentimes is missed, you know, um, when we have, although very, very accurate data, if it can't be publicly communicated in a way um, that resonates with people, then it's difficult to sort of ensure sustained sort of meaning and progress across large actors um, within the society. And so this is where I would say the measurements we have within the well-being economy movement, like a lot of energy and focus and for good reason, right? GDP has been a big problem, um, but it also feels like one of the spaces where people are kind of stuck, governments are stuck as well. So they a lot of them have now embraced or have alternative measurements of progress, but they're not really sure exactly what to do with them, or maybe you know, they're not sure exactly how to met, like balance these different criteria and really translate it into a different form of strategy development and policy design. And so the next section in the guide <coughs> is about designing a well being economy strategy. And there are so many different processes which would be relevant to this. And I would love to hear your ideas as well. But we decided to start with three. Um, and so the first one was really, you know, how do we even identify the aspects, the areas of the economy, you know, the activities or the behaviors that are, are gonna be really important for our well-being goals? How do we align institutions and stakeholders within across government, but across society at large to ensure that we're we're working collectively towards this transformation. 
And really importantly, how do we manage power dynamics and trade-offs within this process as well? And so whilst we don't have all the answers, um, again, we try to provide some resources and examples and tools and tips that can support people along the way. And so the first one, when we think about identifying well-being economic activities or behaviors, for me, it was quite remarkable, the example like COVID, in terms of how quickly policymakers all over the world were able to identify what kind of sectors or workers were most important for at least maintaining current well-being, right? Because for so long, we have encouraged and rewarded large preparations and investors because they're the most efficient at generating wealth, right? And if that's our goal, and we believe, you know what I mean, that they're, they're, they're drivers of the economy, then that's what we support. But when we really had a moment of saying, okay, but who's really essential for, you know, our society right now, it wasn't the hedge fund managers, right? It was really, you know, teachers and farmers and delivery drivers, et cetera. And so this type of thinking, right? And this, this way of starting with with identifying what are the existing activities within our society um, that we see as positively contributing to the regeneration of our environment or to, you know, um, connection and, you know, prosperity and, uh, and ensuring stability, those become the framework for then thinking about which of these activities and sectors we want to really actively promote and why. And what then when we think about also uh, developing the strategy. One of my, another favorite case studies that um, we found was from Utah. So it's a state in the United States, which in the nineties was growing super fast. And they were concerned about the impact that this was having on their environment and people's quality of life. And so they wanted to organize and develop a new growth strategy, right? A new economic strategy. And they wanted to do this in a participatory way that really engaged citizens to understand what they understood, liked about living in Utah and how they could really um, grow and develop in a different way to protect and promote that. And so initially, as often happens, there was quite a bit of resistance from some people who didn't feel like, you know, we should get people, normal people involved in something as technical and important as economic planning, but they made some really strategic decisions, which I think are important. And one was they framed this as a long-term initiative yeah? so that it would be something that would transcend political administrations or cycles um, so that it was really viewed as an iterative continuous process. They also framed it as visioning as opposed to planning. Yeah and as a process as opposed to a project. And I know these things probably sound small, but it was really significant for people to move away from viewing this as just a technical managerial short-term initiative to really something that we're talking about, you know, takes a long time and it took, it did take a long time. They ended up having to engage with so many different um, towns and municipalities, actors to gather the information they needed. They worked with local newspapers to get people engaged and coming to workshops where they would use little um, post-it notes to talk about what they wanted um, in terms of different kinds of stores or green areas around the city. And all of that ultimately now some, I don't know, like 30 years later, has made this initiative sustainable. So it's a part of the decision-making for the government as a whole now. Um, and so, and it's really shifted. So people who used to be very, actually quite anti-government because it's quite a conservative state. An example was a transportation line that everybody had voted against 10 years later passed like with flying colors because people's active participation and engagement and understanding why such a transportation network was important um, led to shifts, you know, in, in people's priorities and their, and their view of government and their role within it. And so the final thing um, is important here. And again, one of these things where I think we have a lot of work to do, which is often in economics and within economic policy, we don't really on power is at its center, but it's not really honestly confronted very often. And so when we think about really deep changes within a system, how are we really gonna manage those power dynamics and how are we gonna honestly reflect on, on the power map, right? And the stakeholders within the system and, and particularly when there are trade-offs as well between different kinds of goals or objectives, how do you manage those 
in a way which is inclusive and fair um, and reduces as much as possible tensions and social disruptions along the way. And so, you know, a good example of this, of course, which is quite, you know, famous is obviously, you know, the just transition movement and ways in which they are trying to balance social and ecological objectives within, you know, the more shorter medium term in order to buffer um, some of those negative consequences for more vulnerable groups as we make certain transitions. And so then we get to the policies themselves, right? So once you have kind of the strategy, where you want to go, how you want to get there. And this is the area where I think the most, <laughs> for me personally, but this is also probably because of my bias, we need the most innovation, yeah? So in my experience, working with almost every government, there, we, our current system policies work to maintain the current system. Yeah, like that's what they do. They, um, they sort of protect the status quo. And so when we're talking about something like trying to change the economic system, or even really whenever there's a broad goal, governments very rarely look at the current policies. They just try to implement new ones. <laughs> yeah, but really actively assessing how are existing policies working in support of particular kind of actors or discouraging other kinds of activities that are important for well-being be a really good starting point to reform the existing ones before you even try to develop new ones, right? And so our questions were sort of how do you assess and reform existing policies and how do you co-create new well-being economy policies? And so these are, you know, there's a lot of different taxonomies for policies, but I think it's really important to always recognize that there's multiple options and ways to achieve the same aims, right? And so often when we think about policies, we think about regulations. So this is where you actually mandate and require behavior in line with a certain sort of thing, or you actively prohibit it. But people don't love regulations. Yeah, so it is something which is, it is it's a powerful instrument, but also one that, you know, you can decide depending on context, if it's going to be the most effective and requires a lot of like, enforcement, right? On the other hand, you have incentives or disincentives, right? And so incentives are, you know, when we're actively providing subsidies or grants or, you know, certain kinds of rewards on the, in order to encourage certain types of behaviors and disincentives can be, you know, taxes and tariffs and these sort of things to discourage, um, you know, behaviors that we don't think are awesome or we don't want for whatever reason. And then of course there's, information campaigns. So where we say, let's try to influence our behavior through information sharing, through knowledge, through campaigns, through databases, through, you know, um, trainings, things like this. And then there's the public provision itself, right? So where, when you were talking about the support or when the state itself decides to act in terms of procuring certain kind of things or providing certain, um, like, goods or services um, or producing them themselves either, even through a state owned enterprise. And so these are often common ones, but really important. There's also the option of the state kind of getting out of the way altogether, right? And allowing for the commons or people to sort of collectively govern and to a particular activity or resource as well. And so there's always a variety of ways, you know, to achieve the same aims. And when we're looking at our existing policies and assessing them, we're really trying to look at what is the coherence of that and how do these policies collectively support one another in order to maintain um, or maybe potentially work in service of, of the kind of shifts we're wanting to see. And so one really exciting area where, you know, we're seeing some innovations is around how we're actually assessing policies, right? And so, the problem with our fixation on wealth generation and the economy is that it's not just our measurement of progress, GDP, it's informed so many of the tools we use to make decisions also. And so cost benefit analysis obviously is, you know, what's the monetary cost? What's the, you know, like monetary benefit of this and how can we balance those two things out in the end? But it's led to this very strange system where I'm going on a little bit of a tangent here, but I was on a call the other day with like the Finnish government and they were talking about how they needed a model to prove that health and well-being was good for the economy. 
And I was like, how is the burden of proof? <laughs> yeah, on our health, right? Like, how can it not be on the economy to prove that it's good for our health and well being, right? But because we have these certain tools that are really, really embedded, it can yeah, be difficult to overcome this kind of thinking. And so an example here that I really like is from Iceland, where their really strong focus on gender equity led them to embrace a process of asking over, again, a series of several years, their governments to and their ministries to really think about what does gender mainstreaming mean? How would we assess policies or design policies in a way that would take seriously their different impacts on different genders, right? And so as a result of that, they're an example of where they've actually put a value like equity as the center point for the ways in which they're assessing policy impacts. And that has led them to then develop much more yeah, progressive policies, particularly for, um, you know, women and, um, you know, more to ensure that economic policies, which policies more general in general are promoting that goal of, of improved equity within the society. And then I'll just say, you know, when we're looked at our current system, then we want to think about how to design new policies. There are so many good examples of like really beautiful participatory experiments from around the world. Um, and this is just one of them from Barcelona where they have created a database where any citizen can propose any policy and they can vote on it online, they can add, they can amend, and there's a promise by the government that they will implement these policies directly, yeah? And so this has led to massive increases, obviously, in civic participation. Um, and also, you know, Barcelona developed a climate action policy recently, which is one of the first in the world to actually be in line with the Paris Agreement and really had at its core social justice in a way that, and a very contextual sort of place-based approach that was, has been viewed by a lot of people as a very, you know, great innovation within this space. And that came from, I think, a lot of this um, culture that's been bred now of, of direct citizen engagement in these kind of policy making decisions. So I definitely want to ensure that we have sufficient time for talking and hearing and everything. So I'll just speak about implementation and evaluation a bit, and then I'll um, open it up for all your questions and discussion as well. So implementation is always the problem in policymaking. Yeah. So what's planned in theory and what happens in reality rarely coincides, right? So when I was working, you know, for the UN, you know, McKinsey, would often come in and develop these beautiful policy documents that would ultimately just sit on a shelf somewhere and nobody would look at it or people would actually try to implement things that they didn't understand and weren't really in line with their interests and so there's just you know something very problematic about that as a process but also had this realization has led to some really important experiments with fostering more bottom-up um bottom-up approaches and people like held approaches to implementation. And so one example is from La Paz, the Barrios de Verdad, where this community and this government had been working on infrastructure development and poverty alleviation and all of these different initiatives for a super long time. And they were like, okay, you know what? Fine. Let's just give this community. Yeah. Ask the community to develop a plan and then give them however much money they need for that plan, plus some extra in case they have some adaptations along the way. And it has been such a resounding effect, the impact, right, on so many different dimensions that ultimately it's been, it's now become viewed by a lot of development agencies um, and, you know, economic development associations as a really best practice where People are trying to figure out how do we really ensure that communities are not only designing, but also then managing and adapting these to ensure that they're aligned with their context and overall objectives. And then when it comes to evaluating policy, right, um, this is where also we're seeing some very exciting innovations, but it's really about, you know, when we talk about the beginning measurement, it's then just also about really using that information. So how do we really assess well-being? And how do we use those assessments to better understand interconnections with this system, 
to really identify best practice and areas for improvement moving forward so we can continuously, you know, come back and innovate and learn collectively about what works, works and what doesn't in our context um, and in line with our journey. And so Scotland, for example, is um, a, obviously a really big pioneer in the space, but they're really trying to figure out, you know, how do we use a national review of data of well-being to better inform our priorities and to really understand how the different dimensions of well-being interrelate to one another over time. And critically, I think, for all of this is really at its heart embracing experimentation. Yeah, recognizing that there's just as much to learn from failure as there is from success. And how do we embrace a culture and build a culture where we don't just say, policymakers, this is your problem. Yeah. And we're going to, you know, hold you accountable to do it or not, but to recognize that we ourselves are policymakers and to jointly work together to sort of figure out um, what works and what doesn't in our context and to evolve along the way. And so this then brings me back maybe to just a summary of this guide where it's once again, it's broken into, you know, sections. It's got tools, yeah, with like hyperlinks that you can link to and case studies and resources. But underneath all of the things that I sort of talked to you about is really just these questions of like, how do we develop and internalize new definitions of progress? How do we expand our understanding of what the economy is and can be? How do we develop policies to really change our economic system? And how do we do all of this and foster this transformation in a way that ensures participation and context appropriate bottom up, you know, um, decision making? And how can we continuously learn and adapt on this journey towards a well-being economy? Yeah. And so I will just end with saying that, you know, we did create a nice looking guide. It's got some pictures and things. So I hope you'll check it out if you haven't already. But the aim is not to develop a PDF, right? Um, our aim is to really try to put this into action. And so some of the things we're working on right now is one, we're test piloting this with governments and communities in Scotland, New Zealand, Canada, and California. But we've also gotten a chance to work with a lot of interested, increasingly you know, interested numbers of governments who are also interested in, in really test piloting and integrating this thinking into their, their processes. We built recently built a We All Policymakers Network. So you might be familiar of with WeGo, which is the Wellbeing Economy Governments. And that's New Zealand, Scotland, Iceland, Finland, and Wales. And they meet every so often to share best practice, things like this. But we wanted to open up this kind of um, opportunity to a much wider range of policymakers. And so this policymakers network is for any government official at any level of government from any country in the world who's interested in coming together to sort of work together, explain their experiences um, and support one another um, on this journey. And so we've only met a few times so far, but we've been, ex uh, we just explored how do we understand what matters for well being and with different um, presentations from a, a government represented in Peru and also from Belgium. And next we'll be exploring how do we understand or how do we measure well-being with um, presentation from Norway and the Netherlands. So yeah, it's a, it's a cool thing. So if you know of any policymakers, that's always good. But it really critically, we recognize that all of this change requires people, us, to feel like we have a right to be engaged in policymaking and demanding that we are doing policymaking in a different way and that we are orienting our economy in a different way. So a lot of our activities are also in trying to galvanize that public interest and advocacy for this type of policy design. And then also importantly, this is a living document. So we really hope that, I hope we have some time to hear from you about case studies or examples tools or instruments that you think could really help um, to bring this alive and to help others who are going on this process. Um, but yeah, so it's a, it's a continuous thing. So with that, I'll say thank you. But I put my information here as well. And I'll put it in the chat too, in case you ever want to contact me as well as we all's um, website. So Nina is obviously a member of we all and a huge, you know, it's building the we all Australia hub. And so 
imagine all of you are maybe connected in some way, but if you're not, I would really hope you will join as a member too. And so with that, I'll leave it and open it up to any questions or reflections or thoughts you might have. Thank you. Thanks so much, Amanda. Um, <clears throat> just a couple of things. A couple of folks have asked if they can get a copy of your slides. So if you're able to just, for I know we've already shared the link to the overall guide, which is really beautiful and easy to read and very excellent. But if you were able to send us your slides, we could put them up on the website with the recording of tonight's tonight, tonight, today's talk tonight for you. Um, Absolutely, I'd be more than happy to do that. Yeah, there's a couple of questions. I will just read a couple out. And then if folks actually want to ask Amanda a question, please just put your little hand up um, on the screen and we'll let you we'll let you speak all by yourself without intervention. Um, there was a good question here from Rebecca. Rebecca's asking, um, in your experience, Amanda, how did it go when a well-being economy kind of policy was being implemented but faced big challenges with legacy path dependency issues. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's pretty much every time, I think. <laughs> yeah. So right now, for example, you know, we're doing these test pilots with these different governments. And I mean, let me first of all say I'm incredible civil servants who really genuinely want to, to promote the well-being of their communities, right? But before we've even started and before they've even asked people what they wanted, they're already so there's already so much resistance in terms of, well, you know, our budget systems are like this. Yeah, like in our we're structured like this, we won't be able to do this. And so before they've even asked people what they want, they're already protecting themselves. Yeah, in some ways against feeling like they won't, that it's just not possible. Right. And so I think there is very real, right? Um, certain sort of institutional setups that we've developed, which for example, one of the big shifts that we're seeing right now is moving from siloed to more integrated and holistic sort of policy making. And that can be really difficult because you, you know, you've developed a culture, you've also developed certain kinds of expertise, you've developed ways of doing things where you're segmenting health policy from environmental policy from you know economic policy and created some weird hierarchies therein and and so that shift can take time but i always think the major thing is the time yeah it's not the possibility of it happening it's just whether or not there might be some steps that are needed in between in order to get there um but yeah i mean it is i think I'm an idealist, I think as you probably tell, right? So I think, you know, the change is only limited by our imagination. But the more people that you have on board and the more people who really not only intellectually understand the importance of our society or the environment, but really have internalized that within themselves of thinking about, okay, well, what really matters to me? Like my family, you know, my community, I really enjoy nature, these sort of things. And that, these sort of knowings, I think, can help to ensure that you have the long-term sustainability that is needed. So it's not just tinkering, yeah, with these certain sorts of institutional structures, but really embedding this sort of change within um, people's own philosophy of what they're doing and why. I don't know, it was pretty, es that's slightly esoteric <laughs> response, but um, yeah. No. Thank you, Amanda. Um, and if you get a chance, Amanda, have a little look in the chat. There's some lovely comments, feedback to you about your um, excellent presentation. A really nice, but very long question from Hamed. Um, I'll just read it out. So um, Hamed asks, well, he says, thank you, Amanda. Considering we already live in a world where capital has unparalleled, unparalleled supremacy um, in association with the corporate welfare state, um, how would a well-being economy movement address the current problems of ownership power and wealth distribution. Just mm -hmm. to clarify why I'm raising this, surely there are moments and places uh, where some improvements can happen in practice, but um, where the dominant capitalist systems in place, the stories remain limited. Mm. Well, there's quite a lot in that question to unpack for sure. I mean, maybe this is a good opportunity also to talk, just to make clear that like, we all like the Wellbeing Economy Alliance is like much more than I work in the knowledge and policy area. So I really work on like what is a wellbeing economy, how do we get there, resources, guides, pay, policy, papers, etc. Right. But I think what's important here is the movement point because we all was started 
just a few years ago, I think like three years ago. And one of the important, so Stuart Wallace is sort of like, he's our chair, he just does it pro bono, but he used to run Oxfam UK. And then he also um, ran the New Economics Foundation. And something that, the reason he came out of retirement to start this was because he really realized that there were so many different organizations and activists and thinkers that were dealing with issues of uh, climate change or mental health or et cetera, but, but saw that really at its root was the economic system. And that if we were able to bind together and collaborate, yeah, we could build the necessary power base, which is needed to really shift the system. And so that's very much kind of our theory of change, where there's there's a knowledge, right, in some ways, and I'm, I'm trying to help with that, that feeds into new narratives. So I think, as you said, the stories, so the stories of what the economy is, how it functions, what our role in and with it, what our expectations are for it, and that feeds and can support power bases, right, like the movement that is needed with incredible groups like this coming together to really actively advocate for these kind of changes, right? And so it's a movement approach. Yeah, that's the idea that if we can get enough people on board with this to really actively push for it, that we believe we can do it. But of course, you know, there's a lot which works in service of maintaining the status quo, not only in terms of power, but also existing sort of institutional setups and, and as you say, stories about capitalism or about what's possible um, within the world as well. Um, I think somebody, was it Warwick? Did you have your hand up? I thought I... Uh, yeah, I did, but my question was more or less the same, you know, just that there are so many policy areas where we already know existing sort of options and ideas and things which would better serve public well-being that aren't implemented because the people with existing power don't want to do it, you know, because it re requires redistribution or a, a giving up of power and power so rarely voluntarily given up. But Amanda basically just answered that question. So. No, absolutely. And it is, it is tricky, right? Because um, I think, I mean, ideally, right, it's not just about like, redistributing power is dispersing power <laughs> yeah so like how do we do that how do we get it so that uh, you know not just shifting hands between corporations or the government right that we're like really giving it back to um people and planet in some way but yeah i mean maybe, maybe i can jump in too i think me, um, well, well on the one hand talking generally is really important it helps us bring together some cohesive approaches and thinking and strategies the devil's in the detail and one of the things that nina's been doing over the last 12 ish months is actually asking all of its members and hubs to put ideas together to show what they're already doing that should be strengthened to shift the economy towards people and planet and the kinds of things we want to change and whether you call that strength based and uh, deficit-based, whatever, um, the devil's in the detail. And the whole point of Nina, which I think has been a really important and quite visionary space, but it just needs a little bit more momentum, probably more resources too. When everyone does everything as a volunteer, it's hard to get the beautiful, glossy communication materials. But the work that we've been doing is important because we've got several thousand people connected, 500 plus paid members. And at least half of those members have attended the webinars, the discussions, and put specific ideas together into this civil society we're calling it a strategy but I like the idea of calling it more of a vision but then the vision can be too fluffy but it's really articulating very specifically okay you want to change ownership you want to change power so in certain jurisdictions what does that look like what does it look like to actually wrestle back the commons or public spaces and how do you do that what are the tweakables um, we've had indigenous elders like Mary Graham and Ross Williams talk about what an indigenous perspective of a well-being economy looks like or a new economy uh, we've had people in the housing community, land trusts, the commons, the food systems, the cooperatives, you know, again, challenging ownership and structure. So when we're feeling a bit overwhelmed by the bigness of it all, perhaps find solace in the fact that there are many of us looking at the, both the granular and how it fits together for the big picture. And I personally feel, and I don't normally take make big motherhood statements, but I do feel that the civil society strategy we've started to develop, which is about 30 pages, and we're just trying to put it together in a way that Everyone can see the raw info, but also a higher level of analysis from an Australian colonial white 
sort of system dominated economic uh, paradigm. You know, how do we shift it here in this place whilst incorporating the ideas around challenging colonialism, supporting indigenous colleagues in solidarity and all of the other social and environmental issues we face. So I guess I just wanna say, please, if you're not already a member of Nina, please get involved because Nina was born from the point of view of a civil society network. Um, I'm excited now to be working with folks like Mike Salvaris and others who are working with government, and that's really, really critical, but we're not sort of a slave to their framework, we're not a slave to walking up and asking for more. What we're doing is connecting all the dots of all of the amazing people already doing the work on the ground across Australia. It's incredible the more you see of what people are already doing, and you join up some of those dots and push you're going to see the kinds of policy frameworks you want are already in place. We just need to then understand the legal barriers, the economic barriers, and of course, the horrific power barriers that we have. But you can't just talk about it. You can't just say, oh, we're going to break down the power. Of whom, for what, and where? You have to get a little bit more specific about your particular goals. And I think that's what this strategy is trying to do, whilst also holding the big picture in mind. Um, I am going to be um, asking Amanda that if we can borrow some of their awesome graphics so that we can connect, you know, the, the imagery and the ideas of the wellbeing economy, but in a more Aussie version. So for our work. So I don't know. I, if they, yeah. No, absolutely. I would absolutely love it. I mean, and I think it's, you know, I'm seeing in here and I, it's true, you know, there's so many false dichotomies. I think there's so, so often, you know, we, we get stuck in this idea of it's like, well, you know, you're, doing circular economy and that's like kind of different right to the well-being economy let me explain how it's a little bit different you know as opposed to saying like we're all trying yep. to do there's more that unites us than divides us right and so um that's one of the things I really love about we all um and Nina and like these like this community because it's really about promoting and amplifying the work that's happening already mm -hmm. so that we don't only see what are the barriers to this but we're seeing the progress, right? And the incredible initiatives that are happening all over the world and the different ways in which it's manifesting. And so, you know, I'd love to hear from you all also, because I have, you know, um, from your experiences in Australia or also maybe within the region, what are examples that you see that are really, I don't know, you see as positive that might be working in support of building a well-being economy? Gosh, I wouldn't even know where to start. Every single person connected to Nina is doing something amazing, like <clears throat> from the food systems to the cooperatives to the housing, co-housing, collaborative housing, renewable energy, community energy, Indigenous, you know, self-determination. Yeah. Maybe when we do our strategy and we share it with you, Amanda, um, you can maybe think about anything that we could add to your case studies that might, that might be filling a gap. Um, I, because I think, and I just wanted to mention to anyone who's listening that on the first night of our Wellbeing Economy Week, on the Monday night, we're actually going to have um, some folks from around the world in the We All um, hubs talking about their work in Scotland, California, um, a couple of other places I can't remember, but they're already locked in on that Monday night, the 1st of November. So if you want more inspiration, come and have a listen to that and all of the Aussie folks doing their good deeds. Hey, um, what's next for you and your team in terms of this policy design um, guide? Is it that you're going to keep yarning and chatting to folks and bringing more stories in? Um, I, I imagine revise it, <laughs> not yet, but in, in a couple of years or something. But what's next for you guys? What do you think will happen? <coughs> yeah, so first of all, it just got translated to Spanish, which I'm really excited about. So we just had a Spanish launch of it. And I mean, there's a little bit of a problem because, you know, I showed you there's a lot of hyperlinks tools, all of the tools are in English. So there's, you know, the text itself is in Spanish, but the tools are not um, yet in Spanish. But what's exciting about this is, um, I don't know, are you, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Sistema Bay, but they're like the, the Latin American B Corp um, yep. kind of organization. And so they're quite excited because they want to do like partner to do like a training of trainers, of policy makers um, around this for Latin America. We're obviously doing a test pilot right now. So there's a lot of stuff that's missing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like in a lot of realities, like one being, for example, participation fatigue. People are really sick of being asked for their opinion and not really seeing any real impact from it. Yeah, and so how do you 
change that, right? Like, how do you foster a culture of civic engagement and really engage people in a way that they feel like it's going to be meaningful and worthy of their time? And that's going to, they're going to be able to, to see this process through the end. And, you know, so there's certain, you know, challenges that sort of come up along the way, but the test piloting, I think is really important, not only to see if there's, you know, other important processes and tools and approaches or, you know, what this, what this really looks like in different locations simultaneously happening, allowing for a diversity of sort of approaches. And then, yeah, our plan is to also transform it into a digital version because our aim also is to create a more user-friendly kind of interface where you would be able to directly upload, for example, case studies that you think would be relevant, right? Or resources that you have, um, papers you've written, stuff like that. And this is, so we're trying to get to that. Um, I can't speak, <laughs> speak to the digital stuff at all, to be honest with you, but it's, it's definitely in the works. And so my hope is that through these experimentations and also connecting, I would love if anybody has more case studies and tools and things that you think could be added because case studies are really important for people. Um, and so when we can share more of these examples of progress and that it's happening, you know, um, it really acts to inspire all corners of the globe. So I'd love to hear from more of you though. If anybody wants to just unmute themselves and yeah. share, you know what I mean? Like if you have any sort of examples of where you think this kind of, you see this kind of work happening, whether or not that's a case study or organization or yeah, just, I would love to hear from you. Or also- yeah, we've, got, we've got 15 minutes left folks. So please do jump in if you wish. Hi, my name is Jai. Uh, I'm in South Australia and recently we got a well-being I guess, health department, which I was part of the community consultation with. And it was interesting seeing kind of the, I don't know how to put it. There was a lot of lip service to well-being in terms of what they said they were going to do. And I felt like kind of it was a bit of a charade at the end of the day with the citizen consultation. So my question is, how do you actually go from having like citizen assemblies that aren't just kind of lip service for bureaucracy? How do you make sure they actually have some kind of measurable impact? Mm -hmm. Because otherwise mm -hmm. I see a lot of new government policies where they want to do the new greatest thing to look like they're doing all the right things. But at the end of the day, they're just doing mm -hmm. token lip services, business as usual. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I think one important, and it's really small, but it's actually quite significant, is that when you are first asking people to engage in any of these processes, especially when it's you're starting with the agenda setting, which is often where the citizen assemblies and these sort of things are about, right? Like, what are your priorities? Like, what should we be focusing on? That you ensure that people are going to be involved in the monitoring and evaluation as well. Yeah. So it's like, you know, if you promise people that it's like, okay, so we're asking you now, but we promise we're going to come back and like, you know, you're going to be able to monitor like how these projects are actually going and if they're having the impact that you wanted that leads to I think it's like a small thing but it's actually a big thing in terms of ensuring that you know there's there's meaningful participation throughout the whole process I think there's also maybe this wasn't part of your question but I should also say that you know well-being has different connotations in different places so it's not always the best word to use obviously you know there's the idea of like Buena Vir or Ubuntu or things. And I know in the UK, um, well-being, for example, is very much more associated with health. So it's a lot of like health and mental often like well-being is what they mean, like mental health in some way. So, you know, there, there can be different um, understandings of, of what that means. And so for us, the decision to use the word terms well-being economy was kind of random in some ways it was like you know it felt like it was a descriptive enough thing but also you know we didn't want it to be economics we wanted it to be economy so it was like a part of life on this planet and I've been quite surprised with how it's taken off but I think the framing matters less than really the point right which is really around like the what is a good life <laughs> yeah like that fundamental philosophical question from the beginning of time and engaging people and really thinking about that and then reorienting the purpose of our institutions towards fulfilling that aim. 
Does that answer your question? No. Mm -hmm. Saul. Hi, Amanda. Um, thanks so much for that fantastic presentation. Um, I'm dialing in from Western Australia and, um, and I love that. And I found it really fascinating, the case study that you gave around Barcelona. Uh, and I guess, you know, really giving a sense of meaningful engagement by having that promise on the other end of delivering what was, um, you know, what was decided upon by the community. Um, I work for local government and um, I see a limitation with this paternalistic kind of relationship between government and the community. I see there being a limitation both for the community and for local government. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, we've got one of our town sites um, has been very, um, it, it seems to have a culture of being quite unhappy and feeling not listened to. Um, and that's been going on for a long time. Um, and from a local government perspective, it doesn't seem to matter how much love and care and attention and money, et cetera, given to this place, it, it feels like their story won't shift. They're determined that they're hard done by compared to all the other town sites. Mm -hmm. From their perspective, um, they genuinely legitimately feel like they're not listened to and like they're, they're forgotten. Um, and it feels like the dialogue's just not shifting. And, um, and by changing that engagement process, I think there'd be benefits both to, to that community in feeling empowered, but also to the local government in feeling like they're not just the, the parent who's trying their hardest and being blamed for not being good enough. You know, it's, it's almost shifting the yeah. responsibility to the community as well. Um, but I think it would, it, it would take, um, local government to, to really trust that the community has intelligence and has critical thinking and the ability to, um, to drive their own decision making and that, that will require a, a trust that might not be there yet. And, um, and on the other hand, it probably requires that community to also understand um, what budget there actually is and what some of the state government and other levels of um, you know, the, the legal limitations actually are in order to be able to engage rather than just sort of um, give a wish list of, well, this is what we want. And so, yeah, when you, when you talked, I could resonate when you spoke about um, government often starting in a position of these are our limitations. Mm -hmm. um, but there are, particularly in local government, there are limitations in terms of how much money you've got and the, the policies and um, legislation at a higher level that really constrain you so it yeah. feels like yeah the community needs to be aware of that mm -hmm. um, obviously we, we want to change as much as possible but we need to be aware of those limitations so that we're we're pushing but pushing for something that is actually able at some point to be implemented it's not just a wish list of something that would be awesome but is never going to happen yeah no absolutely I love it what so what's your what kind of do you work like city council or like in a like municipal government? Yeah, it's a, it's a regional area and um, regional area. like and state. Yeah. Uh, so it's a it's a it's in Western Australia and it's a um, country area of about fifteen thousand people, mm -hmm. and uh, but it's quite a progressive area and they've created the title of sustainable economy officer, which is my role. Mm, I love that. That's very cool. Awesome. So, I mean, I'd love to connect you maybe at some point with a woman who's from North Ayrshire in um, Scotland, which is, I, so she's a local policymaker and I, I, she's going to do a much better job of actually speaking, you know what I mean? Really speaking about what this means within, within the certain context, because you're totally right. Yeah. First of all, like I've worked with national governments and they're super constrained by the global economic system, right? You know what I mean? It's certain sort of global trade policies and things like this, right? So there's always, there are some real constraints. I'm not trying to say that, but I think one of the things which was really powerful within the example of North Ayrshire was how, you know, this shift by giving the power back to the community, right? By shifting the question of like, what do you not, what do you need? need from us right but going to a community um and what they started with was just asking the question what do you like about living in this community and it was a poor community and they you know people were like honestly people come and ask us all the time and we've never been asked this yeah because it's always what's the problem yeah like not what actually do we like here and what do we like about living within this community and then also not always what can we do for you but like what can you do together, right? In order to make these sort of transformations. 
And so reframing is often the sort of like the questions or the approach to engagement. I mean, she said at least that for her, <clears throat> made her enjoy going to work again. <laughs> yeah, you know, like it was a real transformation. And, and I, at the point you said about trust, it's a really tricky thing. And I, I, if you have any insights or anybody has any insights, I noticed so much that that is the biggest barrier is a fear of losing control, right? Because if you really do hand it over, you don't know what the outcome is going to be and you can't control for whether or not that outcome is going to be good or not, right? Because you're not going to say, we're going to do this and this and this, and then we know this is what's going to happen. And that requires yeah, a certain feeling of security or safety or confidence or trust, as you say. And I wonder, yeah, what, what are the preconditions for that, right? Like really, how do we get people into a place where they can, they can feel safe enough to be brave in that way um, and to relinquish some of their own control? And so, and I think there's probably, yeah, that might, yeah. So if anybody has any ideas on, on how you do that, um, yeah, that would be. That would be good. <laughs> if you figure it out, Saul, let me know. <laughs> Please send me a case study. Yeah. I'll include um, it. I'm not sure if anyone else has their hand up, but Eva Cox has made some good points there. Um, I don't know if I'll read them or whether maybe you could read them. Yeah. They're very inspiring ideas, good policy changing, but I'm still concerned that it's attached to the problematic discipline of economics. Mm. In social measurable needs to be included mm -hmm. take this in a broader way and bottom up isn't always sufficiently mm -hmm. to risk innovation and it's a great point you know we are by definition stepping into the framework of economics by talking about economics as opposed to society what are your mm -hmm. thoughts on that um Amanda? no 100 percent. i mean it's a very good it's a really good point um, Ava and I, you know, I think about this a lot, quite a bit for myself as well. I mean, I came to this, um, very much from a passion of kind of learning about economics and being like, what are, what is happening? <laughs> yeah. Like, none of it made any intuitive sense to me, but it like sort of this sort of like love hate relationship with it as a concept. It is very much, um, comes from a particular time period, a particular sort of Western philosophical, thought um which has you know like underpins a lot of our definitions of the space its importance etc and so i can't you know it's it's you might be right that even speaking about the economy just works to reinforce its importance whereas maybe just abandoning the notion altogether might be more useful right um but i do you know at least for me personally i do think we're in a moment where it's just the insane power that the economy has as a thing where you you know our at least in my country, it's like, oh, well, we can't deal with climate change because what would its impact be on the economy, right? Like, oh, we have to do this to get the economy going again. Like it's sheer discursive power of the term economy coupled with this idea that it's so important, but it's too technical for you to understand and you shouldn't get involved within it, right? It's like this ultimate, like, you know, um, deception and like trickery that I feel like is being played on society. So I, I think even if it is, is just about demystifying it in order to make more space for recognizing, as you say, you know, the ethical, that it's fundamentally an ethical, a societal system. And so whatever you call it is less important, but to at least like take it from this sort of like super important abstract and like trumping thing um, back into our lives. Yeah, I think could could, to me, I think is, is useful, but it's a very good point. Absolutely. I saw Kari, your hand went up. Yeah, it's it's Carrie and Amanda, okay. again, um, um, fantastic presentation. I just I just want to take a moment to bring it back to a bit of a, a different sort of perspective for a moment. Um, I'm coming from the angle of as someone who's worked in um, wellness well-being as in from a counselling and um, you know one-on-one -on -one sort of perspective with people um, but having grown up on the land you know being a real crossover between those sorts of areas and I guess one of the things especially at this point in time that you know the fatigue and everything that people are facing in in general in so many areas and 
there have been just so many things from a system perspective that needs to change, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think more and more as time's going on, that's becoming more obvious, you know, that, that perhaps the, the, the space we're in right now is more about system failure than it is about anything else, be that, you know, COVID, be that, you know, climate, be that education, doesn't matter, right? That it's this enormous systems failure. But one of the things that I really discovered with people was their complete and utter not, not knowing where I fit in and where I start and how I can be of impact, but really just about their general disconnect from um, anything as a li themselves as a living system and being a part of a living system in itself. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of my recent work has been around um, providing sort of avenues to reconnect that, to, to bringing people back into this concept of themselves as part of life, as part of nature, as part of even, even into the economy, as part of a living system, right, and how we structure that going forward. And, you know, I just think it's one of those things where allowing that connection and that self-responsibility and that ownership and, and even just that space of I am worthy of a voice and I am allowed to speak and I am allowed to have, you know, I, you know, I guess there's so much between the intellect and the academic and the commoner, you know, that, that a lot of people don't feel like they may have things to say and therefore that silence then sometimes silence their activity as well as opposed to how they can connect it in. So I just wanted to, you know, throw that in as a part of, of reconnecting people from, you know, the ground up with regards to their power and their importance as well. Mm hmm. That's fascinating. I love that. So what kind of strategies do you use for that? Yeah, so it's something I've just been working on over the last few months, actually, um, that has really sort of been in part from the work that I've done and, and really, I guess, being on the ground, listening, talking with people, but in part, um, crossing over and spending a lot of time, you know, in the last year diving into these sorts of works and, you know, being a part of all of the Nina, you know, um, conversations they've been having. Um, I'm also um, married to an Indigenous man. So, you know, being part of that for the last, you know, 20 plus years, you know, with their culture and watching that evolve and, and everything else. So just, it's really a culmination of all of that. And in part, a lot of it goes back to um, a lot of, philosophy and ethics and moral and stuff that's really missing you know from from how our systems are being structured and that's from political to economy to all those sorts of things you know mm -hmm. absolutely thanks well, I've, um we've i think just got that's a, really a part of it for sure sorry, oh. we're just about to run out of time we've got one more question or comment from mike so far but before that i just want to say in terms of the reconnecting people to humanity and life on earth um, I think the deep ecology work that folks like my other organisation, AILA, the Australian Earth Laws Alliance, Earth Jurisprudence, Future Dreaming, all those groups are doing, um, Amanda, it's not directly framed around economy, but it's about rebuilding our civilization to be Earth-centred. So that's the stuff we're personally interested in. And can I just say that's actually why AILA auspiced Nina to have conversations about the economy, but to ensure that it's held within a space where we put the living world first. So, mm -hmm nice to hear you guys talk about that over to you mike hey. thanks michelle just a quick comment and to pick up the point about the narrative i think the critical issue here is how we how we describe and how we conceptualize the economy it's it's been captured as a kind of physical uh, neo newtonian sort of concept in in neoliberal economics and for a long time so that it's removed from our capacity to understand it or to change it. And yet when you boil it down, these are human activities, they're ethical activities, they're daily activities, work, provision for others, how we relate uh, to production and so on. We've got to recapture that because I think that, that's where our strongest ground is. The economy is our servant, we're not its servant. And I, I've really valued the work that you've done, Amanda, and that we always done on that narrative question. It's just so critical to be able to understand it and to talk to people in ways that humanize the economy and make it within their power to change it. 
Absolutely. Oh, it was beautiful, Mike. I would love for you to write that up for us as well. And I'll pass it on, you know, to our team because it is, I mean, if there's anything else and, you know, this is a really quite remarkable group here, but, you know, if there's one thing I, I hope to impart on people is that point that like we are the economy and we can change it. Right. But I think the point of also recognizing like we are part of an ecosystem, right? It's also really important. So I really appreciate um, these comments for you taking the time to be with me. I know we're over time. I'm happy to chat with anybody a bit longer also if you want, but I also wanna honor um, that it's early for you. You probably have other things to do today. So I've left my email in the chat um, and please, you know, feel free to reach out and send me anything or if you have questions or if we can support or amplify any of the work you're doing. We'd really love to do that as well. That actually raises an interesting point. We started a project of trying to collect some pretty cool case studies from around our network, but we don't have paid staff, Amanda. I know that we all mm -hmm. does. So if mm -hmm. there's a chance we could borrow someone to help us write up one pages on some of the cool projects, that's something that would help us. Um, because we're great joiners, we join with all the international networks and all the good ideas, but we're still struggling with no money and, um, you know, we need more people helping to do the work because even if you've never heard of Nina before, it is one of the only networks in Australia that's bringing all the different other movements together to challenge economics um, and to turn it into something far more accessible. So, yes putting it out there to all of you. If anyone That's amazing. Jerry said that he's also happy to help to write some, but I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's definitely, yes. Would love to support, um, you know, in any way we can with this and love to hear. Well, if anyone it. sends you all some case studies for your policy guide, please do send them back to us as well. So okay. <laughs> I'm going right. to put my email in. If anyone is sparked by this conversation to want to help out with case studies, shoot me a note, shoot Amanda a note. Amanda's got her details in there. Check out the new economy conference coming up in a couple of weeks. Please do join. Any money you put towards the payment of all that event will directly fund volunteers uh, a day, a week or so to help keep the work going because someone has to do all of that work. So I want to say a huge thank you to Amanda for joining us on her Monday evening over in beautiful Vermont. And if everyone would like to give either a daggy air clap or press the little button for clapping, now is a good time to show appreciation. Mm. Thank you, Amanda. That was wonderful. People have really enjoyed it. So we're grateful for you and your time. And we'll see you very soon, I hope. Yes, absolutely. See you all soon. Thank you Thanks so much. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.